we welcome them to what we consider the family album. Worcester, Worcester Historical Museum is just like going home for the holidays, okay. hearing those stories and, and, and making certain that you get your voice. So people call, they write, they email, and we try to be as responsive as we can. Welcome to the Founder Story Podcast, where we learn from entrepreneurs about their journey from their first inspiration to their first employee, and even the steps they took to become the powerhouses they are today. Welcome back to another episode, everyone. I am your host, Rick Porter, and today I am joined by the Executive Director of the Worcester Historic Museum, William Wallace. You typically go by Bill? Oh, absolutely. All right, Bill. perfect. Bill. Now, Bill, you've been the Executive Director since 1976, is that correct? I, w- I have, yeah. So uh, we are... It's a, oh, it's a while. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> we're, I'm actually very excited. We were talking a little bit about before the show started. I'm excited to, to hear the history of the Wista Historic Museum and, and how it was founded and created and things like that. Um, but also, you know, as... The theme of this podcast is to bring in entrepreneurs um, in the Worcester community, in the greater Worcester community that have founded businesses that have made the city what it is today. I'm really, uh, I'm excited to actually hear your take on on what businesses helped okay. turn Worcester into what it is today. Um, so first off, let's start off by hearing a little bit about the founder story of the Worcester Historic Museum. Well, it's actually Worcester Historical Museum, Historical. And, and we're and one of the things we're debating is is obviously a rename like everyone else these days. So I, I'm hearing you say Worcester Historic Museum, maybe that's what it'll become. Yeah, the- <laughs> but it was founded in January of 1876, 1875. I'm sorry, I always say 76. January of 1875, and I bet you can imagine why it was 1875. Yeah, I can turn that question back to you. I have no idea. No. That's the eve of the American centennial, 1876, 1776, 1876. There you go. Okay, makes sense. And just like in 1975, when communities didn't have a sense of their history, people in Worcester thought, well, we better form a group to do something about this. So it was, that was a reason. And also, um, some of our founders couldn't get into the American Antiquarian Society, which had been founded in 1812. So they thought, well, we'll form, form our own. Plus, Worcester is changing dramatically in 1875. It's it's beginning to see a lot of immigration from from Northern Europe, from lots of other places. What previously had been largely Irish, so they're seeing a lot of new people coming to town, and and the social order in their sense is being disrupted. Mm-hmm. So they want to protect who they are. You know, if you're from Vermont, you want to save your Vermont roots, and there was a Vermont society in Worcester. They, so they form what they call the Worcester Society of Antiquity. The announcement or the invitation went out on January 21st of 1875. And two days later, that's how good the mail was in 1875. <laughs> they had a meeting on Old Lincoln Street, which has now disappeared. It's in that whole Lincoln Square project at the home of the man by the name of Samuel Staples. No, he didn't sell office supplies. No. He was actually a grocer on, on the corner of Main and Franklin Streets. And he was an antiquarian. He had lots of books, lots of collections of old stuff. So he invited a handful of friends, five friends, to come and say, let's form an organization to preserve for, for, the, preserve for the future the, the, the history of Worcester. Sure. And the focus, I have to be honest, say, wasn't really at that point solidly Worcester. It was Worcester. But they were also antiquarians. So they had, you know, pieces from the Washington Monument and sand from the Gobi Desert was one thing, and an ancient Hebrew lamp. So they collected lots of old stuff. They were antiquarians, and they also book collectors, so they had an enormous library. So they, they immediately formed this organization, which they, f- they name after the London Society of Antiquity, because they wanted to, you know, we're up and coming, we're going to be like London. So we have the Worcester Society of Antiquity. They immediately go into action, they publish, they collect, they have an office in the what I would call the back of the old uh, Mechanics Bank building on Foster Street, a couple of rooms. And they're gangbusters within 10 years. People, people are bringing them stuff, and people want, want to preserve their story, their story in Worcester. So that's, that's the very beginning of it. Um, then 1891, they get their own building. Stephen Salisbury III gives them land and some money. They build the building at Wheaton Square. Um, so they have lots of space, lots of programs, lots of collections. And then we move into the 20th century and our big move. Yeah. Now, the 
it, it's when you talk about membership i mean it started with just those four individuals and then and then as i read over time you know it got to 60 and then it went to 120 and and i think the biggest theme that i saw while reading through the history is that at many points along the way you had so much membership and so many people were turning things in that you running out of space is a common theme for you folks oh absolutely (laughs) they they you know they start with the stuff in their houses they're collectors they want to put it somewhere they have two rooms on the second floor of this bank building and they've outgrown it in no time flat they have they have more hours for people to come in and see the stuff in 1891 they build this this building that's that's you know a a huge auditorium an enormous gallery which is filled with stuff the pictures is just chuckle block full of stuff and a basement that's got even more in it because people were anxious to preserve their story just as they are today yeah absolutely now the 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 Museum itself, you, you mentioned Salisbury. That, that building itself that was originally, he gave it over as well. And I think it was, I read $25,000 or something was, went into the gave, original he construction. He gave some money for the, for the construction of it. He didn't completely fund the entire project. He gave them the land, gave them a substantial amount of money, which really anchored them and got sure. them started. It's the startup money, the yeah. startup grant. And, and, and the building is designed by local architects, Barker and Nurse, and um, it is a proud moment for the Worcester Society of Antiquities. Yeah, and I mean, and you guys recently in in the like, what, last ten years, we've actually redone that space. Oh, we originally we, to we, the original architecture and everything, right? Oh, we left that building. Really? Okay. We moved to Horticultural Hall, the former Horticultural Hall, in the nineteen early nineteen eighties. We abandoned Wheaton Square because it was so small. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is that it 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 was great in the 19th century, but by 20th century standards in terms of fire safety and public access. I remember shoveling those front steps many times. I think I counted 13, and I don't think it was a reference <laughs> to the original colonies. Uh, well, there, was a, there was an access issue, um, and they had put on an elevator and some additional space, but there was no place to expand. Yeah. And that building was about, I've forgotten what the square footage of it was. I think it was about 13,000 square feet. So when the Horticultural Society moved out to Boylston, we purchased their building and and moved up to 28,000 square feet and did a, a significant renovation of that and opened it in, I believe, 1985. Sure. Now, there there was recent talk uh, in the last couple of years of, of expanding or moving again. Well, in, in, in 2010, the, that project came to an end. So yeah. it's, it's a 15- it's a, uh, or 16-year vision. Sure. It's old vision, I should say. Okay. Um, still still earmarked for the future as well? Who knows what the future will, be, you know, will bring for the Worcester Historical Museum in terms of, of when we all survive COVID, what, what money is available to us, what yeah. the support is from community. But the truth of the matter is that what we've done in the last year is realize more than ever, and we, when we knew this, but even more than ever, that the footprint of the Worcester Historical Museum is really Worcester. And 30 Elm Street is the headquarters. Yeah. But the community is the history. And we're all historians. People tell stories in different ways. We have partnership projects all over town. So we'll see what the future brings in terms of the needs of the museum, whether we expand on that site or at some point, I shouldn't say we because I won't live forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the institution will, will, will move, will expand on that site. I think we're, we're looking at all those options. Um, and keeping mindful of the fact that that uh, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Sure. Um, and we'll see what happens yeah, because I, because the interest is solid. The interest is more exciting and more vibrant than ever. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think that was interesting what you said. You know that the history is is the city of Worcester, but it's a, it's the people as well. Um, I just this morning actually I rewatched the 2020 Harvey Ball YouTube mm. video that you guys put out, Great. and that video alone. I think showcases that when you, when you had the, everyone talk about it, what is Worcester to you? What does it mean to you? Almost everyone said it's the people, it's the culture. We are, we are all Worcester. We all have a story to tell. And the, the parallel I oftentimes draw when, when someone's willing to sit and listen to me sp- speak for some length in, in a program, think about it as one of those five or 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzles, those cardboard, you know, $10 jigsaw puzzles that my father used to love to do as a, guy growing up in northern New Hampshire before the days of television and you, you, lousy radio reception in the hills and no money. So we were doing jigsaw puzzles when I was a kid and my father would always sneak one piece when he opened it. 
so that he could put in the last piece. <laughs> so that's if, smart. if you think about family dynamics, you can, I, that's where I learned a lot of my um, skill set in terms of language use, what my mother would call him, all sorts <laughs> of things when they got down to the last piece. But the truth of the matter is we all have a piece of that puzzle and each one is as important as the other. And someone's got that one missing piece. And that's what, that's what we all need to know, we all need to share. So we say to people, it's our history, but it's yours until you share it, then it becomes ours and Worcester is better for it. Yeah. Because we understand who we are, where we're going, maybe, but certainly where we've come from is the basis for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you guys, I think, certainly recently over the last couple of years, you guys have done a fantastic job of getting that message um, of the Worcester Historical Society out onto social media as well. You guys have taken advantage of it. Your Facebook page is very active and things like that. Have, have you found that you were able to bring in a lot of the community and, and share a lot of information with them through social media? Absolutely. It's very interesting to us because we're learning every day from that. We, we, we book our posts a week in advance. We adjust them to, you know, what's going on in the community if need be. And we monitor them very, very carefully. And, and if, if I don't know how many po photographs we've put up of Coney Island, but that's always <laughs> like five-digit numbers in terms of responses and likes. Sure. Smiley face from all over the world. Um, even Maurice the Pants Man the other day was was an immediate, like four or 500 hits. Wow. Of people who have great memories of going there, and that's what we need. We need people to think about their place in community and what they can share about it because that, those perspectives are really, are really who we are. Yeah. So... Yeah, we, you know, and we can be as boring as any other history museum and post something that's, you know, borderline pushes the Instagram um, <laughs> character limit and we think is fascinating and it'll, it'll just be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we are, we are, um, we are, uh, we are retooling, retuning every day of the week, just like Worcester. Yeah, I love that. Now. The Founder Story podcast, you know, that is, that's our goal is to bring in founders from all over Worcester. I'm sorry, I wasn't there in 1875, although many people <laughs> believe that I was. <laughs> but you certainly told a great story. You know, I'm interested to hear uh, of some of the other businesses um, and entrepreneurs that you think have kind of made Worcester into what it is today. As you look back or, or as you research back, you know, do anything, do any particular businesses or entrepreneurs come to mind in that founding of Worcester and turning it in what it is today? Well, you have to, you have to think about the, the, the peaks and valleys of Worcester's history. I mean, first of all, you get, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an agricultural community. Mm -hmm. What changes Worcester starting in the 1820s, late 1820s, is the arrival of the Blackstone Canal. Links Worcester to the sea but also Worcester County to Worcester. Sure. So if you think about the sign that I think is no longer there on Southbridge Street on the on the P and W yards, it says Worcester, the Port of Worcester, which is very strange for people for, for yeah. years. The yeah. Port of Worcester. Well, it was the port. The, the The terminus was underneath that parking garage on Worcester Center Boulevard. 40, 40, 40, 42, 44 miles to Providence, and you had access to the world. So what comes out of that are the beginning industries. That where people would realize they could ship things out of town. You've got the Worcester Chair Factory that was on Front Street. Yeah. Chair makers from North Worcester County were, you know, if you're a farmer and you had nothing to do in the winter and you maybe made a dozen chairs for your neighbors and bartered for a pig or something, you could suddenly make all the chairs you wanted to and you could sell them to somebody and sell them down the river, the, or the canal in this case. Yeah. And we have evidence of them going as far as Charleston, South Carolina for resale. Wow. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's only in business for four or five years, but it's the start of that was those small businesses. Then you can go to the Court Mills. The Court Mills was a, a shared manufacturing building, uh, big big floors, big shops, not small shops. Uh, basically, where the where the um, pharmacy school is now yep. in, in the, where the right old, downtown. Old, old Marriott was. Yep. And you've got um, the Coes brothers coming back from Springfield and entering into a. a, a, a partnership, I guess, with Henry W. Miller, the old hardware store that just closed, to make monkey wrenches. They go off and they, and they make jillions of monkey wrenches for a century. They adjust the monkey wrenches. The monkey wrench is important because there was no standardization of the nuts for bolts. Yeah. So, you know, you couldn't dig through a, a you know, if you're, if you're in a factory where there's 12 looms of floor and your, yours goes down, and everybody else goes down, you, you 
got to fix it really fast. So somebody came up with the idea that rather than looking for a specific size wrench, you could fix it. Yeah, adjustable. Well, you could adjust it. And you could, you know, st- pull the safety on your machine. You could fix it and you could be off and running again. But imagine when you're fixing bicycles and you're fixing automobiles. It's later than that. Coase is in business for 100 years. Yeah. And, and they, come, they come out of that beginning of Worcester industry when Worcester's starting to grow up you know, a little bit. Then, of course, the big one is, Amer- is, is Washburn and his wire factory. Yep. It's, it starts out as Washburn and Goddard, and then they move to what we think of as the North Works with an original building built by Stephen Salisbury II because they don't have capital. So he builds them the building and leases it to them. And, what are the, you know, and, and you, you start to disrupt the landscape that wonderful pond in Institute in Institute Park, which is really a mill pond. It's it's not a natural water feature. It was a brook, and Stephen Salisbury dammed it and created the pond to power the mill. It's 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 those stories of the beginnings of industry that lead us to say the Civil War period when you're making guns. Mm-hmm. Nathan Washburn is making rifle barrels for Colt on the site of the old Colt of the Colt storage fire. Is making thousands of barrels a day for coal, but then you've got Harrington Richardson over on Park Avenue that makes M16s during World War during the Korean War, um, and and going gangbusters. So you got the, the 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 gun business that's coming out of there. If you read, um, you read Mark Twain, he talks about you couldn't hit so the the broadside of a barn with an Allen pepper box. So it's an Ethan Allen pepper box made in Worcester. Wow. Um, so you've got the gun industry, but then you've got the rest. Then you've got Norton coming to town mm-hmm. making pottery yep. in the 1850s. And when glass replaces pottery, then they start to take the same kills and the same materials to make grinding wheels to finish the metals that are being stamped at Wyman Gordon. And, and it's just, it's an incredibly evolutionary history of people who are always retooling and adapting to changing taste, changing need, always being innovating, innovative and enterprising. It's so... They, they all sort of pile on top of each other in terms of that story. So there's no single one. We, you know, we didn't make looms. Sure. We didn't make computers. Mm-hmm. We made everything. Yeah. And, and what we like to tell the world is we made a lot of the hardware. We didn't necessarily make the product. Yeah. We were making some cloth, some cloth, particularly, at, oh, for example, at Kelly Square, where the gas station is now. There was a great big textile mill there, and there were a few others in Worcester, but we really made more looms. So if you go to the Ford Museum, the Henry, the Henry Ford, the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, you can watch a Worcester loom work. You can go to the uh, Museum of Work and Culture in, in um, Woonsocket, and you can see um, Worcester, 19th century Worcester milling equipment because it's, we're, we're the, I don't know, name a computer company. You're computer folks. Yeah. We're the, <laughs> we, were the, we were the Dell maybe of, of the 19th century. Sure. Um, so that, it's that con- continual evolution and reinvention that you were not just making one product until it totally died. You were always retooling your factory, rethinking. What do you suppose? What do you suppose Wyman Gordon was first making? Forget forget the parts for the space age and all that sort yeah. of stuff. What do you suppose they were making? Oh goodness, I would have thought some sort of die cut metal tooling or something. They were making they were putting metal tips on on wooden shuttles for looms so they didn't snag on the on the fibers. Really? They go they go from putting metal from tips there to <laughs> to making bi- bicycle <laughs> sprockets to making crankshafts to you know parts of almost everything that flies yeah. like like the 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 wishbone the the uh, landing gear wishbone thingy for the space shuttle. Wow. So, so the, they're like all, you said, they're retooling and retooling, constantly evolving. Innovative, enterprising. And that's that applies to the community as well. Imagine as businesses are moving out of Worcester World War II and the, and the and needs and the market are changing. And then that's when Worcester says, well, we've got to do something about this. And you think then you get UMass Med School coming yep. to Worcester because it was an active um, lobbying effort to bring it here because they knew Worcester was changing. Had to be responsive, innovative, and enterprising. Yeah, absolutely. And as you look ahead at the future, are there any particular companies you think are going to have a, a a real impact on changing the future of the Worcester community? Oh, that's a, that's that's beyond predicting my skill the future set. now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> predicting the future. My crystal ball is out in the car. I think it's I think it's beyond my skill set. That's why they don't let me run Worcester. Uh, <laughs> our our job is to record them all at the museum. Yeah. 
you record the successes and the failures, the ups and the downs, and and it's that evolving story that we tell. So we'll be we'll be there and ready. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing the story of the Worcester, Worcester Historical Museum, but also giving us so much insight to some of those businesses that help oh, make Worcester well, what it is today. We're in the process of redoing our industrial gallery, so it's it's very much on our mind. Yeah. So we're we're looking at those threads, those continuums through history of, of wire that starts in 1820, and we're still. You know, it's still part of Worcester today, making stents. Yeah, it's absolutely. The story is still there, as opposed to the Valentine industry that leaves Worcester in the 1940s. You know, it's 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 rebuilding, rethinking, and we we're drawing lots of parallels to contemporary Worcester, of contemporary Worcester to 19th century Worcester. Yeah, well, so perfect. we're 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 trying to knit that story together. So we need to hear from all of your listeners who have something to tell us about a family business or factory that we are not yet aware of. Yeah, absolutely. And and what we'll do is in both in the podcast on YouTube and our social when, when we push out the episode, we'll include all of your contact information as well. Please do. Um, for the founders that are out there or the businesses that are wanting running, how do they interact with you to share that story and to they provide that information? Email us, call us. We are our our you know we're in and out of the museum given the COVID restrictions of terms of space and the number of people in spaces, but we are there. We are, we are busier than we ever were as, as people in this fragile moment, their lives change, they move, they downsize or business goes out of, 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 of reality. Then obviously they're, they're calling us and saying we want to take our place, but also the people who have been here for years and years have more time to think about. Their legacy. You know, my my family was involved in that. I want I want to be part of the public record. So we welcome them to what we consider the family album. Worcester Worcester Historical Museum is just like going home for the holidays, <laughs> hearing those stories and 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 making certain that you get your voice. So people call, they write, they email, and we try to be as responsive as we can within the limitations of our small staff and our and the time available. But actually, convert some of them to good volunteers. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I like that. So. Perfect way to summarize it. The and everybody I think would understand that you are the the family album the, for the city of Worcester. We we are we are Worcester. We are yeah. we are the stories of community. We're not perfect. We're not complete. We're not whole with a, with a W. <laughs> uh, uh, but we will be more so as people. What what if people remember that what is theirs becomes ours, and then it becomes part of community. I love that. Take their place in Worcester. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing the story with us today, and thanks for being on. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Founder Story Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to check out some of the other great stories.